There I am. Well, it's good to be back with the family of grace again this morning. Um, yeah, it's at least 26 years. That's how long we've been out in Taiwan. Um, I was working here in this building um, during seminary, and that was started in 89, 90. So it's been a long time. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, we, we just came back from Taiwan in, at the end of April, and we're only going to come for two months. Um, but then when stuff happened with COVID in Taiwan, we said, why go back to Taiwan and sit in our house and talk to people over um, social media stuff? We can do that with people in Taiwan from the U.S. So we stayed here another uh, month and a half. So we go back to Taiwan uh, on the 16th, so a, a week and a day from now. So now we're trying to get the last few things in before we, uh, before we have to go back. Spend as much time with the girls um, in Salem as we can. Um, I don't get to be uh, recorded very often. I feel like I should give them a hard time trying to keep track of me on the stage. <clears throat> um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that... Uh, we can be here together as a family this morning, um, open your word and see what you want us to see. Um, Lord, uh, speak through me, use, uh, use me so that they will hear what you want them to hear. Lord, thank you that we can be together uh, as your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Jordan, Pastor Jordan uh, wasn't going to be here, and so he said, oh yeah, you can preach and trying to figure out what I should speak on because back at the Grace Place in Taiwan, they've heard everything I've ever said. <laughs> but here, I mean, there's all kinds of things I could share. But um, if I get a chance, there's just some, some really important things that um, if I have nothing else to share with someone, I, I, I want them to get these kinds of things. So um, Jordan said that would be great. So, um, my question to you is, of all the things we as Christians are supposed to do, and the Bible tells us to do and such, what's the most important thing? What's the absolutely most important thing? Someone said prayer. Glorifying God. Yeah, some of, some of the creeds say, to, our main purpose is to glorify God and, and prayer. Um, it's, it's one, what's that? Repent, that's a good one too. Um, uh, I ask that question a lot at, at a, a, um, ordination councils and stuff to see what the, those guys that want to become reverends, how they're going to respond to that. <clears throat> and a good response is, well, what does Jesus say is the, the absolute most important thing for us to do? And if we go to, oh, it didn't work. Is it slow? Oh, there it is. This is what Jesus said is the most important thing. Because, <clears throat> look at this, um, Matthew 22, uh, verse 35 says, One of them, an expert in the law, <clears throat> tested him with this question. That's kind of like an ordination council. Like, okay, we're going to test you. What's the most important? And the question is, teacher, and, and you get a, a bit of... Um, uh, uh, sarcasm or something from this teacher in the, of the law, this expert in the law. Teacher, are you really a teacher? Um, which is the greatest commandment in the law? What is it? And what's Jesus' response? He replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and all your mind. We've heard that last time. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. So he, Jesus didn't answer, what is the one? He comes and says, well, there's, there's one really big one, and, but two. There's two really important things, okay? And the second is, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And the, the picture he has there is, these things are like a peg stuck in the wall, okay? These two commandments are a peg stuck in the wall, and everything else just hangs on those. If those aren't there... It crashes to the ground. And so when, when the expert asked Jesus, what's the most important thing to do? This is it. Okay? 
All we do boils down to our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. We're supposed to be loving God and loving one another. Our relationship with God should be good and getting better and better all the time. And our relationship with each other should be good and getting better and better all the time. Those are the two most important things. Everything else, at best, is number three on your list. So prayer is good. Repentance is good. Glorifying God is good. But these are the, the two big top ones. Of course, now if you think about it, loving the Lord your God, well, that's glorifying him right there. <clears throat> and prayer, well, that's relationship with God right there. Repenting, well, that's your relationship with God right there. So when Jesus says they hang from him, it just everything flows out of these two main things. Everything we're supposed to be doing flows out of those things, relationships. It's a continual process of getting closer and closer to God, our relationship getting better. And then the relationship with each other in community as a family of grace um, just builds on that getting better and better, should be. Because if our relationships are healthy and good, we can face all kinds of problems. COVID can happen. Not that big of a deal if our relationship with God is good and getting better and our relationship with each other is good and getting better. We can face problems like that. The furnace or the heating system needs to be repaired. Lots of money. Oh my goodness, that's a big stressor. But if our relationship with God is good and getting better and our relationship with each other is good and getting better, that's not that big of a deal. If it totally goes out and it's cold this winter, but our relationship with each other is good and getting better, we can huddle together in, in warm coats. Of course, we, we'll be in Taiwan. It doesn't really get cold in Taiwan, sorry. Um, but you guys will maybe be stuck here. But if your relationship is good, it's... It's like going camping or something. It's, it's a way of drawing us together, not dividing us. Because Satan will use those things to cause divisions. These are the most important. Everything else are minor issues. COVID, as big as it is, is a minor issue in the whole thing compared to these. Because if our relationship with God is good and getting better, our relationship with each other is good and getting better, COVID is just a minor irritation in the family and how we do things. Satan will use whatever he can to get, to get between us, between us and God, between us and each other, and cause friction, cause divisions. These three months that we've been here we've run into so many churches that have divided over whether or not they should be wearing masks or not in the church. And, and it just, it blows me away that brothers and sisters <clears throat> divide, both of which saying, we won, we got what was right, and Satan just laughs and said, no, you both lost. I won because you guys are divided. There are people out there watching to see if the Christians, if we are different than the rest. What would Jesus do? They're watching us to see what would Jesus do? They say they follow Jesus. What would Jesus do in that situation? How would Jesus respond to COVID? How would Jesus respond to a furnace going out? How would Jesus respond? Our daughter Sarah is down in Salem, and she works kind of very part-time at a church as a youth thing, youth leader. And, and they had the what would Jesus do, but then they had, you know, WWJD. But then they had... H W 
F-L. Has anyone heard that one? As a response to what would Jesus do? Jesus would, he would first love. Very first thing that Jesus would do would be, how can I express love in this situation? So it was really fun when I was down at my home church and, and the men were doing a Bible study on early Saturday morning and I was down there and, and they were talking about you know, going the extra mile. What does that look like? And I was disruptive and said, well, how does that work with wearing masks? If the government requires you to wear a mask. Because this is down in redneck, northern California, out in the boonies and ain't nobody going to tell us what to do. And as we talked about it, one guy had the great thing. He said, oh, he does car shows. And he said, I, you know, I'm supposed to be welcoming people coming, and I'm trying to figure out if, if we're supposed to tell them that they're supposed to wear masks or not supposed to wear masks because it's just it's not clear, and it's out in the middle of nowhere. And he said, what would the loving thing be to do? Look at the people coming and have a mask ready, and if they're wearing masks, they're more comfortable with masks, Throw a mask on. Yes, you're welcome to have a mask. Come on in. If they don't have a mask on and he's comfortable not wearing it, take the mask off. Come on in. How can I express love to folks instead of, oh, you got to put a mask on or, oh, you got to take the mask off? How can you express love to one another? And Satan will use whatever he can to cause divisions. I may have shared this before. Um, when, when we were first studying language in Taiwan, um, we got to the phrase, oh, it's no problem. Don't worry about it. It's no problem. <clears throat> and when, when the teacher told it to us, the, the phrase that they use in Taiwan, she says, but you have to be careful because the actual, you can say, meo one t. One t is problem, question, problem. Is one T. Mayo is not having, not having a problem. Mayo one T. But usually what they say in Taiwan is Mayo not having guanxi. Mayo guanxi. So if someone says, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and go, oh, Mayo guanxi. And our teacher said, the direct translation of Mayo guanxi is not having a relationship. And so the people in Taiwan, when they're saying that, they're thinking, oh, it's not really a problem. It's not a problem. There's, there's no relationship between that and this. But our teacher said, her parents grew up in, in the mainland of uh, China, and her parents would not let her use that because they, they fled Taiwan. They fled the mainland, came to Taiwan, and her parents would not let her say meo guanxi, no relationship. Her parents made, them, made her say meo, not having a problem. Because in mainland China, when you said meo guanxi, no relationship, it means I don't care what you did to me because you and I do not have a relationship. I don't care. And for her parents, to hear that was like, just like slapping someone in the face. So she encouraged me as a pastor in the church, say, oh, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Use the Chinese for one T, not a problem. So I started doing that. And then I started when people would, would say, would say I would say, oh, I'm sorry, and they'd say, oh, meo guanxi, no relationship. I would say, no, 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 yes, we do have a relationship. And because we have a relationship, there's not a problem. We don't have a problem because we have a relationship. If our relationships are bad and getting worse, we tend to assume the worst about the other person. So if we're here together and someone comes walking in trying to get through and steps on your foot trying to get through and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If your relationship with them is bad, you say, oh, that's okay. 
But you did it on purpose anyway. I know you did it because you're just that kind of a person. You assume the worst of someone else when your relationship is bad. If your relationship with someone else is good and getting better, and they come through and they step on your toe and come through and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you assume the best of them and say, oh, it's not a problem. It was an accident. No problem. You give them grace, right? Family of grace. I sure hope this family is giving each other grace because the relationships are good and getting better. We need to give each other grace. Putting a priority on relationships sometimes catches people off guard. Uh, several years ago, we were moving into our house in Taiwan. Um, we had just gotten back from a year in the States here and had gone back and we were getting stuff out of boxes. And the president of the seminary where Debbie teaches um, gathered together a bunch of students, some other professors, and they all came up, uh, drove an hour and a half up to help us unload stuff and get stuff set up. And um, so they, they showed up and, and they helped, but there was food and there was fun and we were um, just sharing and talking and they didn't have a whole lot of time. Um, they took like a day of classes to come up. And so they only had, you know, four or five hours. They had lunch, and we all had lunch together. And as we were leaving, the president of the seminary said to me, he says, oh, I'm sorry, we weren't able to get everything done. We weren't able to get all your boxes unloaded. Well, we got tons of stuff. So that, that would take, it took weeks for us to get unloaded. Um, but I said, oh, you know what? Whether we got everything unloaded isn't important. That's, that's just minor. That we're all able to be together in relationship and be able to have fun together. That was most important. And he was just kind of shocked. But, but we didn't do what we were supposed to be doing. I said, no. If we didn't get any boxes unloaded, it would have been fine. Because the relationships are more important than what we actually do. I've been in meetings where relational activity is seen as a waste of time. We're there to get the job done. And so you don't work at personal relationships. You don't work at being friendly, trusting one another, um, understanding each other, loving one another. It's just, let's just get the job done. We're here to get the job done. And those meetings are just really painful. Just not fun at all. I've also been in meetings where the decisions and direction and vision and work, the policies and the procedures and all that stuff flows out of the relationships around the table. Where, yes, of course that's what we do because we, we love one another, we trust one another and says, oh yeah, that's, that's how we should go. We listen to each other. We have patience. We assume the best of one another. And we give each other grace. Instead of assuming that what I heard was a slam, it was, it's give them grace. What did you mean with that? And to understand and take time and patience to do that. Now, I might be putting too much emphasis on our relationships. And some people say, well, if we do that, we don't get anything ever done. But if I'm reading Jesus right with this, having a good relationship is way more important than the things we might get done. So if the relationships are good, and our relationship with God is good and getting better, and our relationship with each other is good and getting better, what kinds of things should we be doing what kinds of things should be flowing out of that relationship? Well, if you ask Jesus, what, what should we be doing? We need to go to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And it didn't go. Oh, and I just shut it off. Uh-oh. I broke it. I need a beer hammer. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
I trust them. This, oh, there it is, Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I'm a missionary, so of course I've, I've got to share these verses. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is just saying, here, God has sent me, I'm sending you, I have the authority, I, I'm God, and I'm telling you what I want you to do. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go out there and make disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to make a disciple out there? Well, first baptize them. Get them immersed into the, the life of the church. Have them saying, yeah, I'm making my stand with Jesus. I'm following Jesus. Um, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Being a disciple of Jesus means being disciplined. The words are really similar, right? Being a disciple is being disciplined and doing what the teacher wants you to do. Some people don't like the word disciple. I'm a follower of Jesus. Okay? How many of you are followers of Jesus? Okay? Oh, yeah, I follow Jesus. Well, I follow the Blazers. When I lived here... um, and was and I follow the blazers? I, I follow the blazers. I'm a blazer follower. If you ask me who their coach is now, um, um, I don't know who their coach is. Players on the team: Clyde Drexler. Yes, I know. I'm a follower of the Blazers. I don't know when I've watched a full game. The last time I watched a full Blazer, I've seen clips on the news when they've done stuff, but I'm a follower of the Blazers. And those of you who do follow the Blazers are going, you don't follow the Blazers? You don't know nothing. Well, how many, of, how many people are there out there? I want to just say here. How many people are out there that says, oh, yeah, I follow Jesus? Kind of like I follow the Blazers. I show up sometimes. Whether you're following Jesus or you're a disciple of Jesus, discipline, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. It's a full in, full life, following, being discipled by Jesus. To go and make disciples, just cyclical. Get out there, going out and making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. disciples. And then Jesus says, and surely... I'm with you always. There's that relationship with God. Always, I'm always with you to the very end of the age. See, if we spend all of our time in the church just huddled together with ourselves in our holy huddle, we're going to make each other sick. We're going to get driven nuts by one another. The church needs to be focused outward to those who don't know. The great purpose that God has given us is to take his love and grace to those out there. Not be like Jonah and just keep it to ourselves here. And what better way to show love and show others is to show them Jesus. Jesus is the greatest example. We need to be demonstrating God's love and grace to those around us. Oh, I'm losing it. I felt it go. Okay. Sharing God's love and grace to those around us and those far away. So thank you for supporting us, helping us share God's love and grace over in Taiwan. So how do these two things work together? Loving God and loving one another and going and making disciples. Well, John 13, 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Those people that are watching, they're watching you as Christians. They're watching us and how we relate to one another. 
And if they see us loving one another, they'll be able to say, oh, they must have a relationship with God. There's something there that I don't have. I can't find it down at the bar. I can't find it at the club. There's something different there. There's real love. Are people pointing to this church because of the love that's demonstrated here? But are there churches and other that the people who are watching see the divisions and the fights going on? When when I was in seminary and we were part of this church, there was someone in the church and <clears throat> they had come from the East Coast. And we had had the annual business meeting or whatever, and they came. And I, I forget, it was Sunday night or something. And, and when it was all done and, and people were leaving, um, he came to me and said, wow, that's... That was, the, that was the most wonderful uh, annual business meeting I've ever experienced. Um, usually at my church back east, um, at the annual business meeting, eventually someone has to call the police to break up the fights. <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness, what kind of testimony is that to the community when the police show up? It just, <laughs> okay, yeah, it just blows our testimony right out of the water. Okay, um, is the love we have for each other here so overflowing that it splashes onto the others nearby? Can can the neighbors and the people loosely connected to this body and around are they getting sloshed with love because it's just overflowing here? Do they see something different? There are people all around us who don't know Jesus. They don't know his love. They don't know his grace. They just have stuff from movies and television, and that's what God and church is like. And are we giving them a better picture of who Jesus is and what the family is like? If we aren't doing anything to let them know, if we're not going and discipling them and helping them understand if we just ignore them, it's like we're telling them, you can just go to hell. Did I say that? I'm not using it as a casual swear for it. The Bible is full of Jesus talking about hell, and if we don't care what's happening to those people out there, it's like we're telling them, eh, it doesn't matter, you can just go to hell. You don't have to, you can just go to hell. You can spend eternity separated from God and everything that's good because everything that's good is going to be with God. And if you are separated from God, you are separated from everything that's good. So you're stuck with everything that's bad. And I'm sorry, Billy Joel had it wrong because he would say, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners have much more fun But when you're separated from everything that's good, that means you are also separated from any kind of relationship you could have with anyone else because that would be good. When you're separated from God, you are also separated from everybody else. You're just alone, suffering with everything that's bad. And if we don't have that picture in our mind and if they don't get that picture in their mind, <clears throat> then we don't care what happens to them out there like Jonah. And they don't know that they are headed to that kind of a hell. So we need to share God's love and grace with them. Let them know that there's judgment. Let them know what that hell is going to be like. But let them know that God is offering us free a relationship with him. And we need to be demonstrating that relationship to them and amongst ourselves, so they go, that's what I want. That's what my heart is aching for. So our relationship with God needs to be good and getting better. Our relationship with each other needs to be good and getting better. Our eyes need to be out there on the world, not in on ourselves. 
looking to see how we can share God's love and grace with others. So how do we do that? How do we share God's love and grace with each other, with others? It will look a little different for each of us because God created us all a little differently. There are similarities in generalities, but there are difference when we get down to more specifics. So in general, we should ha have the flavor of the fruit of the Spirit. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So whatever we are doing out there and in here with other folks should be looking like that. Should be flavored that way, colored with those kinds of things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's not standing on a corner or in some protest throwing rocks at people. Does that fit that picture? No. What would Jesus do? Yes, Jesus did drive the people out of the temple that we're selling. If there are those of us who have that kind of direct connection with God to know how to do that in love, <laughs> for most of us, what Jesus would do would be love first. Love them first. How do we love them? How do we demonstrate love to them? How do we do that? Specifically for each of us, it's going to look different. Um, my spiritual gifts are helping and encouraging people in that kind of area. Um, and so that's going to color how I do things with others. What's your spiritual gifts? If you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, there's lots of ways of finding out. There's probably an app for that right now that you can get on and, and figure out what... And, and some people get overboard, oh, getting a really specific, you know, it's, uh, just in general, what, what kinds of way has God created you? What kind of spiritual gifts that is in the Bible that, that you can say, yeah, that, that fits. And usually it's done in kind of community because your friends and folks in the body, in the family, can say, yeah, I see that in you. And it'll help you. They're going to color the way the fruit of the Spirit's going to look like in you. And they will influence you how you love others and how you encourage one another, how you make disciples. Has God given you or have you worked out your life's purpose or your mission statement? Do you know what God is... I mean, yeah, there's go and make disciples, but more specifically for you, how God has created you What's your mission statement? What's your purpose statement? I'm sure there are resources out there to help you do it. Um, and usually involves help from people with you doing that kind of stuff. Um, my purpose statement, my mission statement, is helping others or encouraging others. Fits into my spiritual gifts. Helping others do what God wants them to do. It's kind of broad. Lots of things fit under it. But it's real specific. Helping people do what God wants them to do. That isn't um, helping people do what they want to do. Okay? It's helping them do what God wants them to do. So if someone comes to me and says... Yeah, I think God wants me to leave my wife and have a relationship with my secretary, have her break up her relationship, her family, and we're going to go make a family, and that's what God wants us to do. I can really carefully say, nope, that is not what God wants you to do. No, 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 no. That is not what God, that's what you might want to do, but that's not what God wants you to do. If someone doesn't have a relationship with God, it's really simple. God wants you to have a relationship with him. That's bedrock right there. 
You won't know what God wants you to do until you have a relationship with him. And, and as your relationship is good and getting better, you have a better picture of what God wants you to do with your family here and out there. I want to help people do what God wants them to do. How can I do that? My, uh, my goal is not to help them do what I want them to do. And as a pastor and as a parent, <clears throat> sometimes that get, gets fuzzy. Because I want to help my children do the right thing. And I may think that this is what God wants them to do. But it may just be what I want them to do. So I have to be very careful. How do I help people do what God wants them to do? That's going to influence how I do that with other people. How I influence them and show love to them. Now, I worked on my spiritual gifts 30 plus years ago in seminary. My purpose mission statement um, came together about 20 years ago when I was in Taiwan. It's like, ah helping people do what God wants them to do. And then another tool that I've come connected with just more recently is uh, my personal core values. What values are core to who I am and how God has made me? I've only been working on this for a couple of years now. Um, Morrison Academy, the missionary kids school in Taiwan that I work with, um, they've got a very clear purpose statement, mission statement, and then they have a whole list of a variety of core values that give direction to what the school does. And parents or whatever can come and say, oh, I think Morrison should do this and such. And then the board can look at it and go, does that fit our mission statement, our purpose statement? And then where does it fit in the core values? If it doesn't fit in those, you can say, that might be a nice thing to do, but that's not what Morrison's purpose is to be doing. We're to be doing things like this, and that's doing something else. Someone else might do that. And having those core values laid out helps, helps me, helps the school, helps figure out, okay, what things should we be investing our time in, and what things do we don't need to invest most of our time in. It's a process. Um, the Japan field for World Venture kind of started this, and they shared that information with me and helped me work on that. Um, they use the personal core values of the people on the field, get those figured out, and then they put them all together and see what the field is going to be focusing on based on the personal core values. <clears throat> because when we first showed up to Taiwan, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm a pastor, church planter. Okay, I'll go do be a church planter. <clears throat> oh, we also need a, a, a treasurer for it. You finished your first two years of language. Study. Now you can be the field treasurer and keep the books. Okay, I can help with that because I want to help. Um, so, okay, I'll do that. But I'm not all that excited about being an accountant, keeping track of the books. That's not what really... I would, I'm very happy for the, since I did it, um, there's been somebody, there's been several other people that enjoy doing that, and God blesses that. Um, so knowing what's valuable to us, what our core values are, also helps us know what is it that God wants us to be doing. Uh, the Asia Director for World Venture wants us to... Um, all the fields to be heading in that direction, figuring out what our core values are so we know what is it that God, why does God have us in that place at that, this time to be doing? There's a process that the Japan field leader developed, and, and if you're interested, I might be able to share it with you. It's, it's not that complicated. Um, and you need close friends that will help you filter through things and figure things out and say, yeah, that's me. So, of course, one of my core values is helping or encouraging others to do what God wants them to do. It just, it flows, it's always there. But another one is restoring the broken. When something's not working, there's something in me that just says, God's made me that way to, I, I want to fix that. I want to restore that. 
So driving down the streets of Portland, and I, you see an old, I see an old car over there, and I go, oh, that would be so cool if it was fixed up, if it was restored. We've been in multiple homes around there, and if I find a, a screw that's loose, I pull out my Leatherman and tighten that screw up because it's, it's not the way it ought to be. I want to fix that. And when people aren't having a good relationship with each other, my heart goes, oh, what can I do to help? How can I fix that? Now, fixing it, how can I help? Restore the relationship. And if somebody's relationship with God is out of whack, how can I help fix that? How, how can I help you get restored back to God? My third one is a big, joyful family. And I love getting together with the family of God and having fun together. Joy just oozing up through it because of the love and the relationship that we have with one another. Earlier, um, uh, several weeks ago, we were down in Southern Oregon and we were going to be at a a church in Southern Oregon and share with them um, just briefly, just so the pastor was going to preach, but we were just going to, they've been supporting us for 26 years too. And so um, we were going to just, hey, we're here, glad we could connect, be with the family, that would be good. So we were down in southern Oregon um, early in the week, went down on Tuesday or whatever. Thursday night, well, we found out uh, Friday morning that Thursday afternoon, the pastor went home and died with a massive heart attack. 67 years old, and he just died. Just, oh my goodness. Um, the, the church is in shock. And, and the leadership of the church is, you know, what, what, what do we do? Who, who's going to, to preach? Who's, who's going to, what are we going to do Sunday? And they realized we, we were the... the <coughs> The missionaries, they've been supporting the longest, and we were there, so they asked us, can you preach? And of course, yes, I want to help. But, but we also want to minister to people, restore, encourage in the midst of the grief. Um, and, and how do we do that? Helping them grieve well and helping them get through it, that's tough. How God has created you and given you your gifts and your relationship with him and relationship with others, it's going to be colored by your values and how God wants you to go. You need to have a good picture of that. The way it works in Taiwan for me, Taiwan Missionary Fellowship. It's an organization of all kinds of evangelical mission organizations that that get together together Every year we have a big conference, except this year. It's been going for 60, 70 years. But this year, because of COVID, we had to cancel it. That's why I stayed. We were going back to be there. Because this organization is a big, joyful family when we get together for the conference. And then we get together at other times, too. So that just feeds into the, yeah, this is good. Um, and it's, it's helping missionaries and mission organizations do what God wants them to do in reaching Taiwan for the Lord. So that feeds into that. And a big part of Taiwan Missionary Fellowship is a center for counseling and growth, helping missionaries who are struggling, broken, and need restoring. It's like, oh, this is just so much fun to be involved in that. The guy who was doing the core value said, um, if the job you're doing has one of your core values in it, yeah, you you can endure that for a while. I mean, there's none of it. If none of your core values is, you should quit. If, if two of the things are, are in there, you can, you can, do a pretty good job. If all three or four, if, if all your core values are right there, it's just a joy. 
Taiwan Missionary Fellowship was a joy. At the Grace Place, the church we started 16 years ago, um, it's a family. We're together, and it's joyful. Um, we have fun together. And, and there's always a place for restoring the broken. There's always something breaking at church, something that needs fixing. But there's also relationships and helping them get reconnected. And there's always the fun of helping people do what God wants them to do. What does God want you to do? And it works with our neighbors. Our next-door neighbors, we shared here with, with some, um, Mr. Lee, who lives right next door to us, he knows that he can always come over to my house and borrow tools and get my help fixing things. He's not yet a Christian. He's been to church. And that's one way that I can minister to him and encourage him, show him love and grace, drop whatever I'm doing. Oh, you, let me find that tool for you. I got it. And if I don't have it, well, next time I'm out at the hardware store, I have an excuse to buy another tool <laughs> because I can share that with him and demonstrate love to him that, that this is what a big joyful family does is helping helping you do what God wants you to do so how has God created you what things what things get your passions going for God your purpose because some people here and say oh that's right. I really really like the details and making sure things are correct those are the people that we need for keeping track of the money and the details. The, <clears throat> if I said, oh, my, my gift is administration, Debbie would just go, <laughs> no way. But the church needs people gifted in administration, gifted in teaching. They all need to know how God has, has created us so that we can help each other do what God wants us to do and get out there and make disciples, and baptize, and draw people in, and share God's love and grace with others. So what are you doing? Do you know what God is, how God has created you, what your purpose is, and what your gifts are, and what your core values, what's really important to you that God has given you? I challenge you to, to investigate that. Try to figure it out. Work on your relationship with God so it's good and getting better. And work on your relationship with others within the body so it's good and getting better. And when you do, it's so much fun. Following Jesus is so much fun. Serving God is so much fun. Even in tough situations where a pastor dies, there's an underlying joy in serving in those situations where people are grieving. But you know that God's in control and he has it all planned. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you have created each one of us special and that you have given us gifts and passions and desires and values for each one of us in a different kind of mix. Lord, I pray that you would help us all understand how you've created us and how that will work out in loving you with our heart, our mind, our soul, and our spirit and loving one another like we love ourselves. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us insight into how you've created us so that we can be the people you want us to be in all the situations that you've put us. Lord, give us your grace and your love and help us to share that with those out there that don't know you, that are going to hell without you. Lord, give us the compassion to reach out to them no matter what. Lord, thank you for this family of grace. In Jesus' name, amen.